I remember being young and nervous not to mess up or there to be any kind of problem or, you know, just have my back against the wall. And we have a lot of young people at this church. And as we were singing, you know, as you were looking at the screens, the, the screens went out for a second. And Celia, Celia, how old are you, sweetie? You're 12. I just thought to myself when the screens went out, I thought, man, at 12 years old, if I had 250 adults singing and the screens went out, I'd be like, ah! <laughs> you know, it would have been like, it would have been awful. And you know what? This grows us stronger. And praise God for that 12-year-old back there, right? Amen. 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 Um, I love those moments. That's nothing but good. I'm glad the screens did go off. Go to chapter 3 in Exodus. Go to chapter 3 in Exodus, verses 20. We're going to kind of recap just a second of last week going right in because, um, honestly, chapters 3 and 4 are really the same conversation. It just really just keeps going, and so I want your mind to be fresh with where we, we ended last week. But if you're a note-taker... And Celia, I think I got a slide. If you're a note taker, this is kind of the thought, the question of this morning. God's call to your life. Remember, like Moses is hearing from God, from the image of God in the burning bush. He's hearing the call. He's hearing the charge in his life to to go to Egypt, to bring my people out into the wilderness, into the promised land. But does obedience to God's call in your life, your life, does the obedience to God's call require a sentence or a chapter? That's all going to make sense. There was a reason that Brent read from Genesis 12. I want you to remember Abraham and that calling in his life. We're going to talk about that. We're going to mention that. We're going to connect it. But for you, does God's call, his charge, his commands, to be faithful to go or to do, does that take a sentence in your life or a chapter? Look at God's word in verse 20. It says, So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, I will let you go. And I will give the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed. But every woman shall ask of her neighbor, namely, of her who dwells near her house, articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing, and you shall put them on your sons and your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. So remember, thank God for spoiled endings. So God comes to Moses and says, this is what you are to do. This is what you're going to say. And this is how it's going to end. Praise God, right? But listen, how does man respond? So Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me. Suppose they will not listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So going back from last week to this week, Moses asked some very good questions and probably questions that you and I would ask. Who am I? Like, who am I to do any of these things? I'm 80 years old. I'm past my prime. I don't have my benefits. I don't have my resources. I'm a shepherd. I'm in a new phase of life. Like, who am I to do such a large task? And then he says, If I get past that and they hear me, who are you? And what does God say? I'm the great I am. Words, vocabulary, can't even explain me. Brad Douglas made a great thought that I wish I would have said during the sermon last week, and it was just simply, I am whatever it is I need to be in that moment. I am all things. This book can't even contain the definition of who I am. So who am I to do these things? And if they listen, who do I tell them that you are? And then this week, what does Moses say? If I tell them who I am and I tell them who you are, you know what they're going to say? They're going to say, none of that ever happened. I don't believe you. I don't trust you. 
I don't believe what you're saying, you're lying. So in our study, and whenever someone stands up here on Sunday morning and they read before our music, I always want you to listen. I want you to pay attention to all those words. They're usually intentional. So in our study, we've mentioned Abraham, how Exodus really flows through Joseph and his brothers, but then all the way back to Abraham and the promise made to him. So like Moses, Abraham was older. Remember what Brent said? How old was he? 75 years old. He was an older man. So like Moses, Abraham was older. Abraham was comfortable living with his folks. He was in retirement physically and mentally, and God called him to go. But unlike Abraham, Moses did not want to go. He did not want to leave. He's about the same age, same circumstances, give or take a little. God calls him to go. And Moses says, hey, listen, I don't think I'm your guy. They will not know me. They will not remember me. They will not respect me. They will not listen to me. And they will not believe me. That's what Moses says. So keep going in verse 2. What does God say? So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? So remember, he's a shepherd. He's out there in his field, burning bush. He has his staff. So God goes, okay, okay. Who am I? Who are you? Who are they? What's that in your hand? He goes, it's my staff. He says, it's a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. And the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Can you imagine? And he reached out his hand and he caught it. It became a rod in his hand. So that they may believe the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has appeared to you. He goes, if you do this, that will obviously get their attention, right? You wouldn't mind. Furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand in your bosom, put it on your chest. And he put his hand on his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. We know that disease from the New Testament. And he said, put your hand now back in your chest. So he put his hand back in his bosom again, and he drew it out. And behold, it was restored. It was healed like his other flesh. God said that would get their attention. Then it will be, if they do not believe you, nor heed the message of the first son, that they may believe the message of the later. And it shall be, if they don't believe even these two signs, or if they don't listen to your voice, that you will, shall take the water from the river, the Nile, the source of life for these people, and you will pour it on the dry ground. And the water which you take from the river will become blood on that dry land. So remember last week, David just said it. It is normal and natural to have doubts. Who am I? We've all said it. Who are you? We've all said it. They won't listen. We've probably all said it. But God does not come to Moses and go, brother, I don't think you know how awesome you are. Man, you are great, and you are enough Hebrew, and you are enough Egyptian, and you are older and wiser and ready. Like, you are the man. And Moses goes, you know what? Now that I think about it, I am the man. That's not what Moses hears or what God does. He says, listen, if you have doubts, I understand them. Not saying they're right, but I get it. Let me show you what I can do. Not you. Let me show you what I can do through you. So what does he do? He performs three miracles, three signs that God says, I'm going to work through you. He says, give me your staff. He turns it into a snake, turns it back into a snaff. You go, man, that's a pretty wild magician trick, right? But understand, to the Egyptians, that was a powerful message. People in Egypt during this time, as a false idol, they worshiped the snake. Why? It was a sense of healing. So what they believed during back then, almost like leeches, if someone gets, got sick, if my, my brother Philip here got sick, he'd come to the doctor, and I'd go, okay, I don't know, you got a high fever, bring the snakes in, and I'd put a snake on my brother's neck, and the belief was you pray to this serpent, and that the serpent would suck the poison or whatever disease or sickness you have out of you, right? How crazy is that? Make things right. If, you, if you're scared of shots, if you don't like needles, imagine a snake, right? Not good news. And so for the Egyptian... They would have understood 
that what Moses was saying was not just like, hey, isn't this wild that I can do this? No, no, no. He goes, hey, my God that I'm speaking about is in control and over any false God that you might worship or bow to. This is the God, right? The one and only And then he looks at disease and he says, on the topic of healing, there's really no other disease like leprosy. He goes, show them that, that I am the God over true healing. And then he says the source of life, which was the Nile River during that time, any food, any water, any life, any money, anything came through the Nile, through trade or resources. He goes, hey, I want you to show that I am in control of all other false gods over all healing, and I am in control of all of the sources of life. So God tells Moses to show the power of God through him to prove what he says is true. He says, if you want them to listen, think about your own life. If you want people to listen to the bold statement that you are making about God, it is not about you. It is what God does through you. All people want a sign. All people want a sign. These Egyptians, what what Moses is saying is like, hey, brother, like I'm going to have to have a sign. I'm going to have to have a miracle. Can I get this on tape? He gets his phone out and goes, hey, listen, just say it in front of the camera. Because if I can put it up on that screen, they'll go, oh, man, something's going on, right? And that's why you always see that sign, that scene in the movie, or maybe you've done it yourself. The script is always the same. The father is bowing at the bed of his sick fill in the blank. He goes, God, if you are really out there, right? If you are really out there, give me a sign. God, if you are real, show me. Why? Because we all want to see. Moses goes, hey, listen, I'm going to have to give them something. And God goes, I'm going to give you something greater than something. Someone just last week, a few days ago, comes to me and goes, hey, Hunter, why would you say that people have such a hard time believing that there is a God? It's a good question. There's probably a lot of answers. But near the top and its simplicity is just that at the end of the day, we want evidence. Like if you say something is true, you better show me. I want to I wanna hold it. I want to feel it. I want to see it. I want to Speak to it, right? Now, faith is believing. Hebrews 12, 11, faith is believing and not always being able to see. However, God knows that we want to see. Remember last week that one day we will not cower like Moses. We will stare like Adam before sin so enters Christ. So there has to be a sign. There has to be evidence. We want to see. We want to know. We want to trust. And God knows it. So we are called to faith, but God gives us a sign. Fast forward to the New Testament. Jesus walks the earth, and he gives a bold message, much bolder than Moses. And what does Jesus say? I am the son of who? Of God. Which one would you rather proclaim? Moses? Or Jesus, like, like what boldness to say that I am the son of the living God. And not only does he proclaim the message, he gathers a bunch of guys around him and says, I want you to do the same. What do you want us to say to the people? I don't want you to talk about Egyptians and snakes and stuff of that nature. I want you to say that if you trust in that guy, if you put your faith in that guy, if you believe in that guy, then he will forgive all of your sins. Could you proclaim such a message during that day? Like, put yourself in their shoes. Could you go out and go, hey, guys, you see that guy walking? Like, if you trust him, he'll forgive all of your sins. And not only that, if you believe him, if you trust him, if you put your faith in him, if you follow him, then glory waits for you. That is the message. So what did the men say during the New Testament that actually physically walked with Jesus? What did they say like Moses am I to say these things? Like, I'm a fisherman. I'm a tax collector. Like, who am I to say such a message? I need a sign. I need a miracle. I need a star above my manger, right? And God knows it. Go to Matthew 28. Flip with me. God knows it. So Christ gives us a sign to prove our truth. He gives us something greater than a snake 
He gives us something greater than healing. He gives us something greater than the Nile. What does he give us to put truth, to put evidence, to put assurance, to put strength behind the word that we proclaim? What is caught on tape? Look at Matthew 28, verses 1 through 8. Kiddos, listen to me. If you're a young one or you've never heard this before, is there a God? God, if you are really out there, show me, right? What does Jesus do for us? Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. This is after the death of Jesus. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. Highlight, he is not here. There's no snake, there's no water turning to blood, there's no leprosy, it is the risen Christ. For he is risen, and he said, come, see the place where the Lord lays, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and indeed, he is going before you into Galilee, there you will see him. Behold, I have told you this. So they went quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to bring his disciples word. Go back to Exodus. For you and I, we are much like Moses, who am I? But we are also like the Hebrews, also the Egyptians in, we don't believe. We doubt. We need evidence. God, if you're real, we want to see where's the star among our manger The empty tomb is our tape. The empty tomb is our star. The empty tomb is our promise. It's our assurance. It's why Christ did this for us. Look at Exodus 4, starting back at verse 10. This is a a wonderful exchange. It's a very good sense of reality. It goes back to our question of, does your obedience take a sentence or a chapter Look at these few verses. Then after God did all of the the signs and the miracles and told them, told Moses what to do, then Moses said to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I'm not an eloquent speaker, neither before you since you have spoken or after. So what Moses says, I love this. He goes, listen, before you came, God, I wasn't very good at this. And even as you stand here, I'm not very good at this. You have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and I am slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Will you highlight that for me? For all you guys that take a chapter to move. So the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute and the deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I, says the Lord? Now, therefore, go and I will be with your mouth and I will teach you what you shall say. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whomever else that you may send. So from a human standpoint, put yourself in Moses' shoes. His concerns, his worry, his thoughts are understandable. Like I said, not right, but you can understand. But as time goes on in chapter 4, this is way more about just the reality that he doesn't want to go. Yes, they're valid thoughts. No one knows who I am. Who am I? They might not know you. They're going to think I'm crazy. Yes, valid thoughts. But as you keep digging and digging and digging, it really has nothing to do with his worry. It's just the reality that I don't want to do this. So let's say they don't judge me. Let's say they don't ignore me. Let's say they actually want to listen to me. What does Moses say? I'm not any good at this. I'm not a good speaker. Like there's a lot of people that could do this better than me, right? I don't know if it it matters a ton, but biblically and historically speaking, there's been some speculation on what Moses' issue in his mind was concerning his abilities. 
And so there's been a lot of thoughts. One, the heavy of mouth and the slow to tongue. Some of us might be able to relate to this. If you start digging in earlier interpretations, that's just a picture of being shy. Like if I gave you guys, I go, hey guys, I'm gonna sit today. I want to preach the sermon. Brandon Kilburn, come on up. Like, like you'd be like, ah! you know, I mean, like your, your, your soul would just come right out your body, right? You're like, I'm shy, I'm, I'm scared. I'm just not confident. Maybe that was his issue, right? One day I'm going to do that to Brandon just because I love him. I will never see him again. <laughs> the whole not being eloquent, um, if you dig into that, um, there's another verse in the Bible that gives maybe a hint that Moses had a stuttering problem, just speculation really. So he goes, hey, if I get up there, not only am I going to talk too much or not talk enough, maybe I'm just like really loud and like aggressive or, or maybe I don't talk very you know, loud at all and you can't really hear me and I'm not very engaging. Because, man, I stutter. Like, you don't want me up here stuttering. I'm like, I'm not the guy to do this. I can't do it well. Or some people I was reading in a book that he just feared the crowd. After he had left Egypt and he had murdered and all the people kind of came against him, he goes, man, I don't want that. Like, I don't want that stage. I don't want that mic. Everybody in life's a critic. I don't want that in my life, right? That might be you. Who am I? You ever felt that? You ever thought to yourself, like, man, get Hunter to do it. I've heard it. Get Hunter to do it. My child wants to know Jesus. Like, like, where's Hunter? Where's Hunter at? Right? I think he knows Jesus. Are you going on a mission trip and go, hey, guys, this is what we're going to do? And you go, no, 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 not me. Not me. There has to be some deacon somewhere. I know that guy's very smart. Let him do it. Or you ever been really, really called? Like, man, I want to teach. Man, I'm in the Word. I feel God call me. I want, to, I want to love maybe some kids. Or maybe I want to teach a Sunday school class one day. Like, I want to help. I want to serve. But like, who am I to do that? I'm not very good with kids. I'm not well-spoken. I always put my foot in my mouth. I'm not very engaging. People don't really like to listen to me. God, who am I? You ever felt that? I'm uncomfortable in those stages. You know, many characters of the Bible have felt the same about this stage. In Isaiah, Isaiah said, Woe is me, I cried, I'm ruined. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and now I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty, and now I'm asked to speak. In Jeremiah, listen to these words, guys, listen to them. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Remember this? Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Listen. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. <laughs> Listen to this. He goes, you know, sovereign? He goes, God who knows all. I don't think you realize this. <laughs> That's what he says. God, I know you know all things, but hey, listen, I don't know if you've really, really thought this one through. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm too young. Man, I love this. I just want to stop here for a second. I want to grab your attention if you're daydreaming, okay? But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm too young, but you must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I commanded you. And it's just great stuff. I mean, this is beautiful. Do not be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. They're not the enemy. They're not your critic. For I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. And the Lord reached out his hand. He touched my mouth and he said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build up and to plant. He goes, this is what you are to do. This is what you are to say. I promise you they will listen. Go. Go. And what do we often say? I don't know. I don't think I'm your guy. And you know, for some of us, this stage is so scary because you know who's in here right now? I want you to realize this moment. We got visitors. 
We got people who don't know what comes after Genesis. We have people who have been to seminary and pastors themselves. We have deacons. We have people who can quote chapters. We have people who live in the Bible and people who are lost and going to hell in the same room. They go, hey, speak to all of them. You want that stage? You want this moment? Like, think about just how terrifying that is. So it's understandable that anyone goes, hey, listen, I don't know if I can do this. Because it's not just this stage that's uncomfortable. We're all called to do it. You might not be called to preach a sermon, but all of us are called to the Great Commission. Go share the goodness of Jesus with who? Everybody. Hey, Brooke Canavan, I want you to go talk to your neighbor about what? The most important topic on earth which is highly debatable, which is full of emotion and full of opinions. There's different levels of knowledge and backgrounds and denominations and what daddies and mamas have told us. Now go talk to them about it. That's scary, isn't it? Scary. And Moses goes, man, I don't know if I'm your guy. But hear me, please hear me. Moses does not fight nerves. He fights disobedience. God just doesn't give him a call. He gives him a script. He doesn't just give him a script. He gives him the outcome. And we go, well, he can't talk very well. Man, you read chapter 4, he seems to talk well enough. He's arguing with God. you got to be somewhat confident he's talking to a bush on fire. And he has layers of debate arguments. Chapter 7 in Acts even says from Paul's standpoint that he was a good speaker. Hear me. Ability is important. Gifting is important. It is not just simple like, hey, does anybody who can read get up here and lead this church? It doesn't work that way. However, from the beginning of time, God shows us and promises us that the message is light years greater than the messenger. You hear me? And Moses is just like, I'm just not a good messenger. And God goes, I didn't ask you if you were. I want you to be faithful. I want you to be obedient. I want you to trust me. I want you to go. And that is why we are called to witness. That's the word, witness. I've talked about this many times at this church. God doesn't say, hey, Brandon Kilburn, get up here and wow us with your intellect because we'd probably fail. Travis, don't get up here and wow us with your funny stories to engage our imagination. We'll probably fail. Hunter, get up here and wow us with your thoughts and opinions and bent on certain situations. No, we'd probably fail. What does God call us to do? Go and tell people what you think, know what you've seen. God has saved me. I was going to hell, and now I'm promised glory. Last week, there's going to be a moment he sees me as holy. I don't hide my eyes, but I stare and gaze at perfection. He has saved my marriage. He has saved my mind. He has saved my soul. That is what's happened to me. Go tell people not what you think, who you are, or your abilities, what God has done in your life. It takes all the pressure off. All the pressure off. Who am I to look at Chris Hunley and go, no, Chris, that's not what you saw. God saved my mind. My mind was in the gutter. What did Isaiah say? He goes, man, the same mouth, hang, that's what he said, my lips. The same mouth that spewed vulgarity is now praising Jesus? Like some of you guys are sailors. And you are vulgar and you are dirty. And now God transforms that to like you're praising the Lord's name? Talk about it. Talk about it. Hey, brother, you don't understand who I was. You don't know who I am, who where I came from. You don't know how I've hurt people. My crimes against humanity. And now I'm in church singing? Nobody wants a sermon from you. They want what you've seen. What has God done in your life? 
I have so many men and women go, Mother, I can't do this with my kids. I can't talk about what you're talking about. It's complicated. My brain doesn't work that way. Brother, you can look at your kid and go, Honey, look at the sun. Isn't Jesus good? You can do that. Like, I was broken and nasty, and man, isn't Jesus good? You can do that. Who made your mouth? Who made your tongue? Who gave you air to breathe? God goes, man, this is not about you. This is about me. And if you keep it on me, you will be successful. Who made your mouth? I said this last week. But this book started off rapid speed, right? 40 years, 80 years, and all of these things. Chapter 2 is literally 40 years of this man's life. Chapter 4 is just him arguing. David Evans and I were talking about that just before sermon. Like, like how many times does God have to say go? Hang with me. Go, I am sending you to the Pharaoh, 3.10. Go, gather the elders of Israel, 3.16. Go to the king of Egypt, 3.18. Go, and I will make your mouth and teach you what you to say, for you to say, 4.18. Now just listen to these words. You don't have to flip, okay? This is what Brent read to us. Go, 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 go. Now the Lord said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. A few words. So Abraham departed as the Lord had told him to. So in your life, Celia, put the slide back up for me. In your life, does your obedience to what God has called you to, does it take a sentence or does it take a chapter and a half? Forty years in one man's chapter and then the same chapter is all arguing, all debating, all worrying, all not believing, all being unfaithful. For some of us, not all of us, for some of us, God has called you to do something very specific in your life, and you know what it is. I don't know what it is. Maybe you don't fully understand it, or maybe you do. I don't know. God calls us to sell our homes and sell all our stuff and move to other countries and be on mission. God calls us to adopt. God calls us to give more and abundantly than we even perceive being possible For some of us, God calls us into ministry to plant churches and to teach and to love and all of those things, right? God specifically calls you to certain things, right? But for some, it's just the obedience and everyday faith that we argue. Like it's not moving to Africa, it's just praying with our wives. Like who am I to do that? Like have you heard me pray? Have you heard me? I've heard you talk about other things. I've heard you talk a lot about giving and serving. Some of you will die arguing with God about giving. You will die arguing about God with serving. It's daily time with God. How many times does God have to say go in your life? And if you're a note taker and you've lost me, will you write it down for me? How many times does God have to say go in my life? Go, 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 go. Who am I? Who am I? God has spent the last chapter and a half telling Moses exactly who he is. Keep going in the story in Exodus Look at 14, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? Will you highlight that for me, please? So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, not Aaron the Levite your brother. I know that he can speak well. And look, he is also coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. 
And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to all the people. And he himself shall be as a mouth for you. And you shall be to him as God. And you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs. So there's just a few things that stick out to me that I think is good. One that we need to be aware of. It says, so the anger of the Lord was kindled. Psalms 103 says, the Lord is slow to anger. But do you know what that verse means? Praise the heavens that he is slow to anger, but it also means he gets angry. Right? So hey, 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 hang, hang. So here's a great question. What angers the Lord? We probably need to know this. It's the persistent disobedience to what God has obviously told you what to do. If you read this text and you read this story, it's not rocket science. God is angry. Is angry. Why? It's the persistent disobedience to what has obviously been told from you, told you by God to do. God continues to be with Moses and provides him a helper in the aid of Aaron. I want you to see this because sometimes we can get confused because it almost seems like God's out of ideas. Or God is changing his plan. He's like, man, this is not working. I got to do something else. I think his brother's pretty good at it, right? That's not what's happening because I want you to see in the text, what does God say? He goes, hey, isn't Aaron your brother? Isn't he a good speaker? What does he say? He's already on his way. So God already had him coming, right? He wasn't like, wait a minute, Moses, I got to make a few phone calls. He was, I got a helper coming to you. Please, please hang. So I want you to take this moment in because it it connects to something rich. So in Moses' life, so far in the story, God saves Moses at birth. Moses is born with a bounty on his head. Moses is born dead. Do you remember chapter 1? If a male is born, do what? Kill him. So Moses is saved, born dead. God saves him. And then he takes Moses and he molds him and he equips him and and he's with him in the midst of palaces in the wilderness, right? And then the God who saves is the God who sins, right? Following me? And then he gives him what? A helper. What does this sound like? Moses is born dead. It's done. Kill him. Moses is saved. He's equipped. He's guided in the midst of highs, in the midst of lows. And then God says, now you are ready for my calling. Go. And for your success, for the fulfillment of my plan, I'm giving you a helper. Right? Listen to the words. I want you to flip, actually. We're almost done. Go to Acts 1, please. Don't give up on me, okay? Go to Acts 1. Last time I have you flip, I think. Go to Acts 1, I promise you. Kiddos, will you listen to me, please? Go to Acts 1. God saves Moses at birth. He prepares him in highs and lows. And now gives him a helper after he gives him a charge. Look at verses 4. Look at verses 4 through 8. It says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which... He said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Valid questions, right, from man. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power. Hang on it, highlight it, whatever you got to do. 
But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and all to the ends of the earth. God still saves, still molds, still sends errands, but he sends us something much greater than Aaron, and that is the Holy Spirit. Obedience and trust and faith to go can be challenging and scary and uncomfortable, but through Christ, we are given something greater than snakes and waters and healing. We are given something greater than Aaron being a good speaker. We all argue, we all doubt, we all desire comfort. We all want evidence. We all want a star among our manger. But Christ gives us his spirit spirit to point all things being truthful in which we proclaim. Christ died for our salvation and our forgiveness, our acceptance into glory, but also for you and I to have a helper, which he said is greater than him walking the earth. So you and I say, who am I? New Testament, we're closing up. Who am I in a New Testament life? And Paul would say, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Like, who made your mouth? Who loves you? Now go. Now go. How many times in a New Testament spirit-filled reality can we question God? Do you not know that you are God's temple? That's who you are. Moses couldn't say such a thing. Moses couldn't say that. God sent Moses, Aaron. God sent you, the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that the God's Spirit dwells in you? As we pray here, This is a message for the lost. You know, I was preparing this in my office and I was rehearsing this last statement and and I was talking just solely about the reality that um, for saved individuals, God is calling you to something. What is it? And it's a fair question. Are you saying yes? Are you saying no? Are you arguing or are you going? But even for those who are lost, and you say, man, I, I, I don't know that Jesus in which you spoke about, Hunter. I didn't know the Jesus that you read in the Gospels that proclaimed the message. I, I didn't know that Jesus. I don't know about the Holy Spirit that you read about in Acts. Like, that's not the Christ I know. But, Hunter, I've heard you read the Gospel a million times. But that stage is scary. <laughs> Hang on every word. That seat you're sitting in as a lost person is much scarier than this stage that I stand on. Get up. What angers the Lord? Persistent disobedience to what he's obviously called you to do. Get up and go. God, I believe... I profess, I put my trust and my faith in you, and God says go. For you that are saved and you say, I am living in this space where I know what God is calling me to do, I'm just arguing. I'm just arguing, who am I, who are you, they're not going to listen, I'm not capable, I'm not good at. Do not invite the Lord's anger into your life. And then, lastly, before we pray, if you go, hey, Hunter, I don't know where I am. (laughs) I think I'm saved. Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I am. And I think I'm doing some good things. I help. I give. I served. I I cooked for your dinner there a minute ago. Like, I don't know. Pray, God, would you have me go? Would you send me? What does my future look like for you? What are you calling me to make clear in my life? Either way, starting with me, we all pray. God, reveal, enlighten, show us. Give us the courage to move. Let's bow our heads. God, we thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for this word. Oh, it blessed me. It blessed me this week. So, Lord, as we close, um, I think this message calls to all of us. 
I think it calls to the lost man. I think it calls to the saved. I think it calls to the Abrahams and it calls to the Moseses. I think it calls for the one who argues and the one who's faithful. There's seasons of life, Lord. We know as Abraham, there was moments where he failed. And his arguments and disobedience lasted chapters as well. We're, we're sinful men and we're sinful women. We're sinful young and we're sinful old. We need Christ. So, Lord, I pray that you make it so obviously our sin and then also what you would have us do. Lord, show us, reveal to us, and give us the courage to go. Give us the opportunities to share, to witness. As, as he told Jeremiah, don't, don't put fear in us, a fear of people, the fear of this stage, the fear of the conversation. Let us faithfully tell people what we've seen. This is what God has done in my life. Change us, save us, send us. In your precious name, the church says in harmony, amen. amen.